people in US want to be in India because they see so many opportunities in India. Successful entrepreneurs in India today are solving the problems of either global scale or for large businesses and so on. The new education system is you first fall in love with a problem. People in rural India and tier two cities, they know the problems of those places better than anybody else. Today we have with us entrepreneur and venture capitalist Gururaj Desh Deshpande. Deshpande Foundation, which he founded along with his wife Jayashri Deshpande, is a global philanthropic organization nurturing innovation and entrepreneurship in communities and universities in India and other countries. Desh Deshpande has founded several centers of excellence and innovation at leading universities of the world. In Karnataka, Deshpande Foundation is changing the social and rural landscape of North Karnataka districts through skilling, social startups and rural entrepreneurship. Uh, welcome to this uh, interview. You say that innovation plus relevance is equal to impact. How do you decode this idea of social impact in India? Well, that's, that's a very good question. So I think what I've learned is that you can look at the world, the 7 billion people who live in the world, and about 2 billion of them have disposable income, and about 5 billion of them don't have disposable income. And making it the difference in the lives of these 7 billion people is what everything is about. Entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship and everything else. Now, most of the technologists and the high-end entrepreneurs work making a difference in the lives of the 2 billion people. So, if you want to make a difference in their lives, you have to compete for the opportunity. And therefore, you have to bring something new. So, innovation becomes very important. And that innovation has an impact when it meets relevance because it, that innovation has to be solving some burning problem that these people have. So innovation plus relevance is equal to impact and that impact usually happens with a free market economy. So, so innovation plus relevance for the people with disposable income is what creates new companies and that's the excitement about unicorns and new companies and startups and everything else. But when you talk about the 5 billion people who don't have disposable income, they're just struggling to get through the day. So innovation doesn't mean anything for them. So the solutions that you bring to them don't have to be patentable, earth shattering, very competitive or anything like that, but they have to be the most relevant. So if you want to make a difference in the lives of those people who don't have disposable income, it's relevance plus innovation is equal to impact. So you have to co-create the solution with them. You have to build capacity within those communities and then slowly start injecting innovation. And as solutions scale, you'll get an opportunity to be more and more innovative and use all the tools that we have developed for that 2 billion people economy, like financial engineering, technology, uh, process management, strategic planning, all these tools that you use in, in big businesses, you can use them in the social sector. C can you share about your experiments and experiences in social innovation in India? What has worked and what has not? Uh, you know, this is a new effort for us. So we started about 15 years ago to experiment with this relevance plus innovation is equal to impact. So one of the programs that we started about 10 years ago is a farm pond program. A farm pond is nothing but a hole that you dig, let's say 100 feet by 100 feet by 12 feet. And that is enough rainwater that you store in the pond to irrigate five acres of land. So in 2013, when we started, in the first phase over the couple of years, we built about 150 of these and built it for free. So we learned how to create one of these in four days, but also wanted to make sure that the farmer actually makes more money. And he and he was. He was able to get two crops instead of one crop. So a lot of them doubled the crop, doubled the income, and some of them changed the crop and made even more income and so on. And so over the next five years, we built about 5,000 of these. And those 5,000 were actually 
funded partly by, mostly by the farmer actually, 75 percent, and we paid 25 percent. And now we are extending this program to 100,000 farmers where the farmer actually pays 20 percent. Typically, it's about our lakh, that farm pond. So he pays 20,000 up front, either in kind or cash. And then we get them a loan for 80,000 rupees through State Bank of India and HDFC. We build the farm pond for them. We manage the construction and everything else. And typically, the farmer pays a lot, makes a lot more money, and he pays back the loan. And then he builds a credit rating, but once he's paid the loan, all the additional money that he makes from these farm ponds is his. So he, he owns the farm pond. And so in my mind, uh, that's a, a great way to develop products for the social sector where the returns are guaranteed. And you know it's a good product because thousands of farmers are now waiting for these farm ponds. And what's holding us back is just our ability to execute and build these. You know, this year we're building about 8,000 of them, which is a little bit of a challenge. But once we do 8,000, then 20 should be easy, and then 50 should be easy, and so on. But it's, it's just like a company. You have to develop all the logistics, you have to develop the technology, and so on. So, so it's exciting. Even as we advance in technology, there is a criticism that um, many of the products are not affordable to the common people. Uh, how do you think that we can address the, this, uh, for example, by developing uh, technologies uh, that are affordable and are also relevant uh, to common people? Well, y you know, you can subsidize, but just subsidy doesn't really spread the solution to masses. The good news is the technology every time is getting, every year is getting cheaper and better. So it's almost like it costs half the money and it doubles the capability. So the curve, it's the trend is the right way it's heading. It's a question of finding these interventions where if the farmer, you know, for example, the farmer cannot afford a farm pond, but he's more than willing to borrow the money because he feels like the outcome is guaranteed. So we need to, and, and that's where just innovation is not good enough. A lot of the people who come with new products for the farmers are innovators. And they think that if they innovate a solution, the problem will go away. Which does in the other market where people have disposable income. But in this market, you have to co-create the solution with them. And in fact, that's the value of the Dishpande Foundation because we have, we work with about 100,000 plus farmers, we have 1,000 people and so on, and we have an incubator. And that incubator is actually called a living laboratory for ideas. So if people have ideas, they can bring it to this startup incubator, and then they can work closely with the farmers that we work with so that they know upfront whether it's a solution that's worth doing now, two years from now, or six years from now. And, and once they know that, then they can work on it and build a company and make it really relevant for the farmers. This leads to the topic of skilling. Now the enrollment in universities and colleges is uh, increasing, but when it comes to employability, we are far, far behind. What is the way forward? So in skilling, we have a large program. Uh, we have a program where, you know, there's a lot of young men and women who graduate from colleges. So that's 15 or sometimes 17 years of education. But even after all that education, they cannot get a job. And that's like 95% of the young men and women don't get jobs. And the government already has a very good n new education policy, the NEP, which says that it's not enough just to teach them domain knowledge, but you have to teach them soft skills. You have to teach them all the other skills that you need to really make use of the knowledge to solve problems. So in some ways, in some little ways, we're trying to inject that into the education system. So inculcating that curiosity in these children is NEP. So what we're trying to do is, is we are starting with the kids who are already graduated and find them a way to get the employment and then slowly keep coming down the years so that 
you don't have to do this remedial program when they graduate. They'll already have the skills to learn what they need to learn and just go get a job. So it's very important that, you know, I think because people who grow up in these villages naturally have the relevance. And so if you can give them some competence, they'll come up with solutions that will be mind boggling and, and that will be really, really relevant for the problems we're trying to solve. How important is understanding a problem to arrive at solutions? Well, I mean, you have to understand the problem to solve this mm. solution, but the solution can come from lots of different places. Mm -hmm. And also the solutions have to be, you see, I think in the social sector, unfortunately what happens is you don't have the power of the market feedback loop. In the for-profit, if you have a solution, a customer has to pay for it. And the customer will not pay for it unless it's solving his problem. Whereas in the social sector, money comes from either the government or philanthropists or foundations. And the beneficiary who is receiving the service does not pay for it. And so you could be doing things that he doesn't really need, but doesn't matter. You don't have that powerful loop back. And that's why in most of the programs that we do, we try to get a skin in the game. We want the farmers to pay for the farm ponds. We want these young men and women from villages to pay for that education that we did. I mean, they may not be able to pay for the whole thing, but at least for a part of it. So getting a little bit of that feedback loop where the people that you're trying to help actually are grateful and want more of it, and they're saying, I'm willing to pay for it is very important. In terms of startup ecosystems, where do you think India stands globally? When it comes to startup systems, it's amazing what has happened in India. You know, I think I left in 1973, almost 50 years ago. Uh, and first few decades, it was like a, totally a strange phenomena, venture capital, startups and everything else. And then there was a lot of curiosity among people to know what's going on in the US. But now it's the other way around. People in US want to be in India because they see so many opportunities in India. We have so many unicorns, we have so many technologies. So, so entrepreneurs are everywhere. And, but the successful entrepreneurs in India today are solving the problems of either global scale or for large businesses and so on. So we are yet to see a revolution where millions of entrepreneurs in India solve the problems of rural India and tier two cities. So I'm hoping over the next decade, uh, you, you'll, you'll actually see that revolution where millions of entrepreneurs from rural India and tier two cities will actually come up with solutions and move this country forward. You know, uh, the, most of the new jobs are gonna be created by these small startups. In fact, the world study shows that we need 70 million entrepreneurs, you know, employing roughly five to 10 people, and that's how we get the seven billion people employed in some ways. So uh, if you have 70 million entrepreneurs, there will be a lot of entrepreneurs from rural India and tier two cities, and we need to continue to develop the ecosystem for that. And when it comes to rural transformation, uh, what according to you are the key interventions that are required, particularly in the Indian context? Well, first of all, you know, people need a little bit more income because if they have more income, then they can solve problems. Uh, you know, one, one nice thing about India is that it's amazing how, it doesn't matter how poor people are, that they give so much importance to education. You know, it's okay for them to starve themselves as long as they can educate their children. That commitment, I've not seen it anywhere else in the world. And, and I think if somehow India can find a way to educate the next generation children, uh, the country will move forward very quickly because we have a lot of young people here. And, and if they're well educated, uh, I think we'll, we'll move a long way. And, and there's a lot of good organizations. I'm very closely involved with Akshay Patra. It's amazing that they can actually feed two million children every day so that the kids can stay in school and actually get the basic education. You know, anybody today who gets a SSLC education can make a pretty decent living. And so it's important that we 
we pay attention to education. And there was a notion that only those students who score high uh, become successful in life. Not so anymore. Because now we see in innovation everywhere. How do you see this changing, the idea of success? You know, the old education system was you first went to school, colleges, you learnt everything. And after you learnt everything, you practiced it for the next three, four, five decades and then you retired. The new education system is you first fall in love with a problem. So people who have a deep insight into the problem itself are the people who fall in love with it and then they learn whatever it takes to solve that particular problem. Because knowledge is free these days, it's all available everywhere. So people in rural India and tier 2 cities, they know the problems of those places better than anybody else. And so it's more likely that they will be the solution providers for a lot of those problems rather than people from big metros trying to solve the problems of these people. So I think the future is very bright and, and the opportunity is ours. And you know, we always talk about demographic dividend or demographic liability. But if we create opportunities for the young people, I'm sure they'll take care of the country. It was nice talking to you, Mr. Deshpande. Thank you for sharing your insights.